some of you, the discussion we are going to carry along in this series may be a little more novel, but many are already aware of the existence of at least the symbolic factors with which we are to be concerned. The possible relationship between astronomy and religion has been so often discussed that nearly all Bible students, the students of comparative religion, are aware that such analogies or parallels do exist. We are interested, therefore, in determining, if possible, their validity and what they have contributed to our general knowledge of man's beliefs. Perhaps astrotheology would be a useful instrument as a common denominator of religions, for elements of it and traces of it are to be found throughout the world. In some way, for some reason, and the origins are obscure, these concepts unfolded together with man's religious and philosophical ideas and became almost universal. Now how does this happen? The most obvious answer lies in the original unity of arts and sciences in the religious life of people. The first stargazers on their tall towers or ziggurats in the land of Babylon, these stargazers were astronomer priests. There was no differentiation between science and religion. We may say that almost certainly sciences were originally cultivated because of their religious content or for the reason that they helped to support the religious convictions of the people. We know that the temples were the first colleges and the ancient towers and palaces of the gods were the first astronomical observatories. There is a legend which some of you may have run across to the effect that the constellations were named by shepherds watching their flocks at night and with very little else to do allowed their imaginations to trace the imageries by connecting stars into patterns in which some likenesses or appearances uh, to various creatures could be traced. I think these shepherds were the shepherd priests or the shepherd kings of old times, the keepers of the sheepfold, which was the ancient name for the temple. In any event, many words that we use, many terms that we commonly uh, find in our language, arise from the religious, astronomical reflections and contemplations of our ancestors. Actually, as one of the ancients observed, astronomy is the science of the anatomy of the universe. And to a measure, these same ancients believed that the universe was the body of a blessed God. Therefore, astronomy might be termed uh, the uh, anatomy and even the physiology of the body of the deity. <laughs> this deity being represented as this God who is extended and distributed throughout the infinite diversity of his own parts and members. In any event, at a very remote time, men learned a considerable about astronomy. It is quite likely that there have been cycles of remembrance and forgetfulness in this subject. A. E. Wallace Budge, keeper of the Egyptian and Assyrian antiquities of the British Museum, declared that the Chaldean astronomers watched and measured and charted the motions of the heavens for more than 25,000 years. Now, of course, from a man of his standing, this is a rather unusual statement. And yet, I'm certain that he felt that he could prove it. 
this tremendous amount of observation, even without the instruments that we know today, must have led to a variety of discoveries. We feel, for example, that ancient man was greatly limited in his astronomical researches by his lack of a telescope. Yet we also have record that the ancients knew certain things about the solar system in particular which it seems impossible they could have known without some kind of a telescopic equipment. Perhaps the Chinese have the answer. On the wall of the city of Peking there is the remain of an ancient observatory. It was partly reconstructed by the early Jesuits but the instruments are essentially Chinese and they have a complete observatory without a telescope. Now what they did to meet this peculiar need was a masterpiece in optics. They discovered that by using a long hollow tube without a lens they could restrict the light of the sky and concentrate the energy going into their own eyes. And by means of these tubes without lenses, they were able to make a number of observations which would not normally be possible to the individual. They were able to give us a very clear understanding of many peculiar details. For instance, we find in other parts of the ancient world the full and obvious knowledge that the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Persians at an ancient time knew definitely that the planet Venus was never visible to us as a complete sphere, but most often like a minute lunar crescent. They also discovered in the field of Babylon the rings on Saturn, and the ancient deity of the Babylonians corresponding to the deity Saturn is always shown st standing in the midst of rings which circle his body. These things are not just accidents. They tell us that at a long ago time, men made comparatively accurate observations of the world in which they lived. Pythagoras, writing or teaching about 600 years before the beginning of the Christian era, was one of the first to note that the planets in their chariots, the chariots of the gods, circled around the blazing altar of the sun. He is accredited generally with the first statement of the heliocentric system of astronomy as we know it today. How then have we forgotten all these things? The only answer is that in the waste of time, in the destruction of learned institutions, in the gradual decadence of the great temple mysteries, conquest, pillage, war, and destruction, many choice and valuable records were hopelessly destroyed, as in the case of the destruction of the great Serapian and Brockian collections in Alexandria. Thus we dropped a dark curtain across history, having obliterated most of the early relics and records of man's intellectual life. We have every knowledge then that in the general and broad need of the world ancient man was reasonably well equipped. He knew the earth was round. He was aware of the western hemisphere long before the beginning of the Christian era. And according to Plutarch, the historian, the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the Great Lakes area of the United States was explored by Grecian navigators at least 15 to 1800 years before its rediscovery at the time of Columbus. And of course Columbus really was searching for a passage to Asia. He did not realize in the beginning that he had discovered a new continent. These ancient records and many legends and myths and fables all point out things that we should know but which we have gently ignored. It is almost certain that the Chinese navigated the coast of California 2,500 years ago. And during the period of Genghis Khan, 12th, 13th century in Mongolia, 
the Chinese and Tatars were well aware of the Western Hemisphere. We have forgotten a great deal. And we have forgotten a great deal of the source of what we call existing knowledge and the reason for it. And many things which we consider to be superstitions and legends really developed from a very astute observation of natural phenomena. One thing that ancient man had that we do not have is leisure. Now the common man of his day, whether he was a builder of pyramids or an agriculturist, probably did not have much leisure. But there was a very broad, deep, scholarly class, particularly the priesthood, then the custodians of all knowledge, who not only had leisure but an infinite kind of patience, which also runs short with us. This is the kind of patience which will permit a problem to be passed down through twenty generations without impatience. Observations and reflections were not carried on by small groups in a period of months, weeks, or even years, but became the projects of empires and of dynasties and of descents of families, so that one problem may have been labored over for a thousand years, each generation, each century, bestowing its own fragment of further insight. Thus, by observation, with great patience, man accomplished much. Another factor which had something to do with all this was man's dependency upon himself. Today we are no longer dependent upon the faculties and powers with which we were originally endowed. We have supplemented these powers and faculties by innumerable devices, depending more and more upon mechanistic substitution. We no longer need or call upon the resources of our own observational powers. Some years ago an experiment was carried on one of the American Indian reservations where it was demonstrated that a certain Indian of reasonable attainments not a cultured man as we would term one, just a man who lived with his flock, watched them at night like the shepherds of old, and lived as our primordial ancestors lived. This man could distinctly hear a watch ticking in a man's pocket 65 feet away. We have no such power of hearing as this. It's gone because we have no need for it. The present moment, we pick up the phone, get the correct time. Our entire way of life, when someone wants us to get out of the way on the road, they give us a blast we can hear a mile away. The individual no longer needs these faculties. He does not re faculties. He does not need them for his survival. He does not have to scent game. He does not have to scent danger. And with the way his fog is now, his senses wouldn't last long anyway. But in any case, he certainly, in those days, had the clearest and most complete possession of his faculties. He lived simply. He ate simply. <clears throat> his foods were not denatured. His life was not filled with unnecessary artificial tensions that close in our modern man. He could contemplate. His mind was not disturbed by the confusions that we know. And while he had his problems and his troubles, most certainly, he lived a simpler way of life. And with this simpler way, he was close to nature. And his intuitions, his inspirations, and his revelations had an authenticity which we cannot deny. For we know that all forms of knowledge that we boast today originated in times when the powers and faculties of man must have supplied him with the total uh, instrument with which he worked. He had to be able to produce these things out of himself. And because of that, we marvel at algebra, we marvel at geometry, and all of these forms of learning. But they came from the past, from long ago. Man has improved upon them. But in the dawn of time stand the shadowy figures of the originators. And these figures, some ways, stand head and shoulders 
above those who have made new and useful applications of these first great dynamic thoughts. And in this group of dynamics belongs our problem of astronomy. Now in astronomy in those days, we involved another term, which uh, perhaps has fallen likewise into evil times, and that is the term astrology. It is unlikely that with the exception of navigation and the calendar, that ancient man studied uh, astronomy from any great and profound interest merely in the heavens and their motions. His interest was in meaning, not in motion. He was searching the heavens for truths, not facts. He was looking for dynamics. And always his problem was to apply his knowledge to the immediate problem of his own existence. And out of these long observations, which perhaps gradually evolved his concept of the seasons, came the calendar a method of determining the periodic return of seasons, the eccentricities of the calendar, and many interesting details. The Egyptians, for example, had a calendar which corresponded with a circle, 360 days in the year, 360 degrees in the circle. But they gradually came to discover that this was not quite right. They found their year getting badly out of order. So they created five intercalendary days, and they set these days aside and apart. And to these, these days they assigned the birthdays of the five principal gods. Um, interesting also to bear in mind that the Chinese and the old Egyptians and the very early Greeks did not have a septenary system of planets as later came into existence but as the Chinese call them, the five emperors, the five great sidereal emperors. For the Egyptians and the Chinese were well aware of the fact that the sun and the moon were not planets. Medieval man did not know this, however, and constantly combined the planets and the luminaries to form the septenary. But the older people, like the Egyptians, decided that these five days should be the birthdays of the planets, and they set them aside. We are working now with the calendar reform project, and the only way we can make it work today is by the introduction of intercalendary days, so that now the thought is that we shall no longer have a 365-day calendar with leap years and other uh, inconveniences, with the days of the week falling on different numerical days of the month and so on but that we shall go back to the old idea of having 360 days, 360 degrees, and set aside the five days, not this time as birthdays of the gods, but now as our five world holidays, which would not be counted. They would be the intercalendary days. In this way, we could simplify many contrivances and problems, but would make life very difficult for astrologers who would have the problem of trying to determine this equation in correcting charts. Down in Central America, where the, lunar, where the uh, Sun-Venus calendar was represented on the scales of the great dragon, which the feathered serpent of their philosophy, it is said that the great, the great deity of the uh, Kichi Maya complex, Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, that this deity gave them the calendar, the Tanlamatl, the book of the sacred days. And by this calendar, which was ornamented with the symbols and devices of the gods, the world and time, both were divided into epochs, eras, and compartments, and separate units, and to each was assigned a deity. These people went so far as to assign a, a divinity to each hour of the day and night, anticipating the medieval astrologer's planetary hour system. All through the ancient world, the calendars and the gods went together. One of the first uses of the calendar probably was to determine religious feasts, and we still have this concept in the church calendar and saints' days. 
and many other similar devices. The calendar then served a great many purposes. First and most, however, it served man to observe the seasons of his planting, of his reaping. It told him when to watch in Egypt for the inundation of the Nile upon which his life depended. It taught him to prepare for the rigors of winter in other climes. It gave him an accurate way of measuring the annual climate of his world. It also told him that each of the changes of the seasons brought new forces into play in his environment and the conditions under which he existed. Each of these changes had its good side and its bad side. Each brought something if he could know how to use it. Each took something away. Therefore, he must provide at certain times. Tithing came from putting away the seed, 10% of the seed, for the next harvest and gradually our agrarian ancestor found that the heavens in their motions regulated his crops which the farmer of uh, our own generation also has learned to know. Experimentation on farms in Arizona under the Department of Agriculture has shown definitely that there is a relationship between the growth of plants and the various phases of the moon and things of that nature. So in his practical observation, our ancient priest, ancestor, prophet, made use of these forms of knowledge. He did not gain them immediately, but he should have been able to observe, if he kept the records, the seasonal motions over these thousands of years and observe the results in his own life. Way back in this time, a discovery was made. We do not know who made it, when it was made. But it certainly was long before the beginning of the Christian era. And it was probably made in that great philosophical complex of peoples uh, that flourished in the Near East and the Valley of the Euphrates from three to 4,000 years before the beginning of the Christian era. It may have been simultaneously discovered in India and China, for the records are to be found everywhere. And that was that there was another and larger motion that had a very important bearing upon life. And this motion was the precession of the equinoxes. This term, precession of the equinoxes, to one completely unfamiliar with the subject, is just a little difficult to explain briefly. But it means that there is a slow but constant westward motion of the equinoctial points. This motion is exhilarated by a combination of solar lunar activity and slightly retarded by a reverse planetary activity. As a result of these forces pulling in contrary or inconsistent manners, this precessional motion now means, and has meant as long as man can remember or learn, that each year uh, the sun reaches the equinox slightly sooner than the year before. That actually his, the uh, coming of the sun is a little over one minute earlier each year, making an astronomical degree in about, 60 year, about 72 years. Thus every 72 years uh, the sun seems to drop back at the equinox one degree. If it so does, it drops back approximately 30 degrees every 2160 years. And it drops back around the entire circle to any hypothetical point in one longer cycle of 25,920 years. In this period of time, the sun seems, only by appearance, seems to drop back around the entire circle of the zodiac, falling or falling backward or failing backward at the degree of the rate of one degree every 72 years. This has been a very important time pattern and the complete uh, precession of the equinoxes requiring 25,920 years 
is referred to as the great platonic year. Plato was aware of it 300 years or more before the beginning of the Christian era. We know it today. No one has ever been able to shake the phenomenon. We have found new explanations for what caused it, but the fact that it happens is still beyond controversy. And this peculiar heavenly motion has, has significance in a very wonderful way and is perhaps the most important link that we have between astronomy and religion in ancient times. The precession of the equinox, therefore, means that every 2160 years the sun reaches the equinoctial point in a different sign of the zodiac, each sign constituting 30 degrees. If this occurs then, we see the appearance of the precession in which the sun appears to enter each sign in its last degree and by, uh, by precession move backward through it to its first degree and then pass into the next sign entering that at its last degree and moving back to the first. So this motion appears to be in exact opposition to the rest of the motions of planets and other elements composing the solar family. This peculiar observation, the study of the Platonic year, has led to a great many wonderful symbols and philosophies. To get a further picture of this, we must now move to the story of the sun. I think we all know that it is reported that our very remote forebears were sun worshippers. We know that the Pythagoreans rose at dawn each day to meet with him and song the rising of the splendor of the day. We know also that the Hindus worship the sun god under the name of Surya and uh, honored it riding in its chariot across the sky. We know that the sun in China was the symbol of imperial heaven and always the sun as the great symbol of light was held with extraordinary veneration. We also know that this experience of the sun was closely related to the agrarian cult or the belief that uh, religion was an experience of growth in nature. The farmer recognized his indebtedness to the sun. By degrees men came to realize that only by the sun's power uh, would the grain grow. Only by the power of the sun would light be given so that man could go out and labor. That if he was too long separated from the sun, man himself lost much of his vitality and power. And by degrees, the sun became a god symbol. The all-seeing eye of the ancients, the eye of Horus in Egypt, is actually a symbol of the sun, as is the pupil of the human eye. The sun was regarded as the eye of God, and it is said in the Bible that God made his tabernacle in the sun. All this sun worship was not merely a physical acceptance of the sun as a god. I've talked to a number of followers of very primitive faiths, known to be sun worshippers, and I've asked them if they actually worship the sun. They said, no, we worship or accept the sun as a symbol of a principle in the universe. It is not the visible sun, but light, the sense of consciousness, that light makes all things clear and plain and open. And we remember the Pythagorean definition of God as a being whose body is composed of the substance of light and whose spirit is composed of the substance of truth. Thus the sun was the symbol of the light of the world the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The sun in its daily rising was the symbol of renewed hope. It was the promise of another day of opportunity, of labor, of fulfillment. 
Ancient man was terribly frightened by an eclipse of the sun because he thought an evil spirit was seeking to destroy the sun. And much of our doctrine of the dragon that ate the sun and other stories and fairy tales come from eclipse phenomena. Also, eclipse phenomena seems to have sustained the belief that there was an adversary or an evil power that wanted to destroy the sun. Man did not fully understand the meaning of the solar power, but he made re representations of it in gold. And these were worn by the priests as the symbols of the fact that they served the sun. Most decorations, military or civil, such as the Croix de Guerre or the Légion d'Honneur, were originally taken from sun medallions. We reward or honor the individual by bestowing a sun symbol or a rosette upon him. The uh, halos around the heads and bodies of sanctified persons have gradually taken on sun symbolism uh, attributes. These persons were radiant, radiant with spiritual powers or with great light within themselves. For the royalty, for the emperor, the king, or the, the great person, was reserved also the solar coronet. A crown is nothing but a sun, surrounded by a burst of rays. And as time went on, apparently these rays got to be a little inconvenient, sticking out in all directions, so they were turned in to the top forming the ducal coronet and the crowns of the kings of Europe as we know them today, like the great English crown of St. George. Then among Christian peoples an orb and a cross were placed upon the top of the crown to symbolize the power of Christendom, and the crown became a radiant throne for the symbol of the Christian mystery itself. The sun, then, has always played this vital part and we have had sun gods. Every religion has had them. They have always been wonderful, radiant beings. And nearly always they were the direct offspring of deity. They were the highest of the gods. And the tragedies that came to the sun gods were the tragedies that most affected mortals. When Baal the Beautiful the sun god of the Nordic peoples was slain by the mistletoe arrow. All the world wept, and darkness descended, and the joy of the gods was destroyed. Apollo was the sun god of the ancient Greco-Latin, Helios, and he is the one who drove his shafts or rays into the body of Python, or Python, and caused the great serpent to be killed and thrown into a great ravine in the earth. And later upon the site of this ravine and over the corrupting body of Python was raised the shrine of Delphi. The sun god was always the slayer of evil because he was the overcomer of darkness. He was always the thing that saved men from night. And later in the place of the sun god itself came the sun or light symbol, the candle, the torch, the fire. These also dispel darkness. They were protectors. And the little candle shining in darkness became the symbol of man's hope and of his faith. And later in great diffusion is preserved to us in the illuminations on the Christmas tree. The world tree with its lights is the symbol of all the candles lit from the great power of the sun. In India there was much philosophy upon the nature of the sun. And we could go into a great deal of abstract thinking relating to their knowledge of astronomy, which was profound, and upon which much of their theology is likewise based. But in round terms, because time is short, and as Hippocrates said, art is long, uh, we can only make a summary of this situation. But let us accept what is generally demonstrable, namely that upon research we find that ancient man venerated the sun as the visible symbol of an invisible power in space, as the light bearing witness to the life, that there was a life behind the light. Now remember in the Greek, Helios, later the Latin Apollo, 
was not regarded as the source of the solar light. He carried on his arm a great shield. And in the center of this shield was a boss or knob. And our modern astronomical symbol for the sun, a dot in a circle, is the shield of, Ar of uh, Helios, the god. And it was upon the surface of his shield that the sun god reflected the light of space. The ancient did not assume the sun to be the complete source of its own light. They assumed it to be a great focal point in space, which collected the great energies from the field of space and reflected them downward into another condition of space which we call matter. Therefore the sun was suspended twixt space and matter, causing the energy of space to permeate all material things. It's an interesting and dramatic concept, and in their ancient arrangement of planets, the sun was placed in the middle orbit, with three planets below and three above, or rather two and the luminary below. Thus the sun was placed in the midst of things. It became an indicating symbol of spirit, of self, later of soul. It was that which represented finally also man, suspended between heaven and earth. It had numerous philosophical meanings, but wherever it appeared, it became an emblem of life and salvation, of redemption. The wonderful Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten created the sect or cult of Atonism, which was the worship of the solar globe, the rays ending in human hands to raise up or to lift all things because he had already discovered from the wisdom of his people the drawing power of the sun, that the sun raised water and took it into the sky to form clouds. Ancient man watched these things and with his own quiet wisdom he knew them well. The Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu tells us in absolutely perfect modern terms the entire phenomena of clouds, rainfall, and so on. These things were known, although we have forgotten that our ancestors were so wise. Now the sun deity, having to a great measure become the symbol of life, passed through three paralleling cycles of apparently similar activities. These cycles, similar in their structure, but different in their time equation. By the great processional motion, the sun seemed to retire around the zodiac in 25,920 years. By another motion, the sun seemed to progress through the signs of the zodiac making the complete circle every 12 months, causing what we know as the year. The third cycle of the sun was its apparent motion around the earth, by which it achieved the mystery of the 24-hour day. These were the three cycles of the sun, the three complete circles which it made of varying magnitude. The least of these cycles in their unity was the day, which consisted of dawn as one of its important points, that in the day the dawn was its vernal equinox, noon was its summer solstice, sunset was its autumnal equinox, midnight was its winter solstice. Thus the sun, according to the Egyptians, rose every morning from the underworld, traveled across the sky, and at night descended into the land of Amentet, where it shone for all through the night for the souls of the dead in the underworld. Now some of the old documents give us a peculiar little hint about this. They tell us, for example, one of the old manuscripts, that the people in the underworld lived upside down walking around on their heads. Is it possible that the Egyptians had already discovered that the so-called underworld was the other side of the earth? We do not know with certainty, but we do know that they had navigated as far as the Western Hemisphere. So that it's quite possible that the people walking around upside down were not creatures of mythology, belonging in some fantastic ghost realm, 
but simply the recognition of something that is factually true as far as we are concerned. In any event, the sun shone in the daytime upon the world of the living and gleamed at night in the abode of the dead. The sun also had this secondary motion in which it went its great circle of the year. It was born on the 25th of December at the winter solstice. It won its great battle, its resurrection over winter, was achieved at the vernal equinox. It was enthroned at the summer solstice, which occurred at that time in the sign of the lion, rather than in the sign of cancer, where we have it now, and was therefore enthroned as the lion of the tribe of Judah, and also was seated up on the throne of lions, as told by uh, the legends of King Solomon, and we know that Solomon is composed of three words, Saul, Om, On, the name of the sun in three languages. All these different symbols, and then finally at the autumnal equinox, the sun goes forth to meet the mystery of winter, where it is to finally meet its death. So the life of the sun, the annular life of the sun, from its birth to its death, became by degrees of the greatest significance to ancient man. And out of this sun going through the twelve signs of the zodiac each year came the story of the twelve labors of Hercules, for Hercules is a solar deity as his name implies, and also the wonderful labors of Samson, for the word Samson in Hebrew means the sun man that we can't escape these implications. There's nothing we can do about them. We know that at the summer solstice he carries away the gates of Gaza. We know also that when he slays the Nubian lion he enters the sign of Leo. And that when he is taken into the house of Delilah and his hair is cut short he is entering into the sign of Virgo the Virgin which is the beginning of his decline towards winter. At which time, of course, his rays or his hair. These are cut off and he loses his strength. But at the winter solstice, he pulls down the double columns of the house of the Philistines, and the old sun dies, making way for the new sun, which is to be born in the mystery of the winter solstice. And as the old king dies and the new king is born, we remember the words that were spoken at the court of France. The king is dead. Long live the king. In that moment, the sun is born, the new sun. We represent it today when the season is right, but we think of the year as an infant being led in by Father Time, the old year. So old Father Time goes his way and the new year is born. These symbols have come down to us from remote antiquity. And always uh, the old and the new labor together, and forever ancient Cronus is combing out the golden hair of the solar maiden. It is a, a very interesting and profound symbolism and upon it a great deal of religious material has been built. Now in this development of the religion of the solar deity or the solar being, we know that it goes through the signs that this again becomes Sindad, the sailor, whose adventures are nothing more or less than the twelve labors of Hercules very thinly veiled. They are also the labors of all the heroes, from the heroes of fairy tale to the great epic heroes. We know that always Siegfried is the sun lad, or the sun uh, hero, who slays the dragon with the enchanted sword Notan. We know also that Siegfried, like all the solar heroes, finally dies. And in the great immolation scene of the Gotterdammerung, he is burned upon the funeral pyre. But out of the rising of the great waters at night, the Rhine or the ocean, there comes a new heaven and a new earth, and the gods go away, and the new gods and the new world come into being. Thus always this symbolism lives, making for us a wonderful drama, a drama we find in India in the story of Rama, the manner also in China in the Yellow Emperor. Japan is the only country in the world of importance that made the sun god a goddess. It is the one ancient people that made the solar deity uh, feminine and the lunar deity masculine. 
Just why and how, again, is one of the great questions. But in any event, Amiterasu Omikami, the goddess of the sun, is represented in Japanese philosophy by the metal mirror, the perfectly plain mirror that is hung over the gates of the Shinto temple. It is the symbol, again, of the reflector of light, and it relates to an incident long ago as told in the Nihonji and the Kojiki, the great classic epics which describe how the sun goddess was brought out of the cave of darkness by seeing her own reflection in a mirror. It was all very wonderful and gives us another phase of the same great story. Everywhere then, these things play into religion. And with this basic thought, we now come uh, to the larger year. Incidentally, of course, we have to realize that in all the cycles, uh, particularly the year cycle and the platonic year cycle, the sun is related to the sign of the zodiac with which it is at that time or moment most deeply or definitely concerned. The processional motion has changed things, but in our symbolism we have preserved the old way. Consequently, before a brief lecture, let us not be too astronomically concerned, but merely try uh, to point out the symbolism, fully aware that there are astronomical equations with which modern science will not be in full agreement. But as we are dealing not with astronomy but with symbolism, these equations are negligible not worth the problem of reconciling them, although it can be done. This point, then, we have to bear in mind that we conceive today the vernal equinox taking place in the sign of Aries, the sign of the ram. We assume that the summer solstice takes place in Cancer, the sign of the crab, that the autumnal equinox takes place in Libra, the sign of the balance and that the winter solstice takes part, place in the sign of Capricorn, the sea goat. And the sea goat, it's part of its body, a goat and part of fish, relates to the two ancient Babylonian cities of Babylon and Nineveh, one of which was built upon a mountain and the other by the shore of the sea. And the combining of the glyphs for the two cities gave us the present form of Capricornus, or the sea goat. Now as the equinox takes place, these become associated with the seasons. And we recognize that the ancients, knowing the ways of the world and the ways of life, had certain emblems or representations by means of which they identified certain procedures in nature. Now the summer solstice, which was the sign and symbol of the greatest fertility, was associated with cancer, the crab. This cancer is also the scarabasaka of Egypt, the scarab beetle the symbol of life and immortality. The winter solstice, or the symbol of death, was Capricorn. And uh, Capricorn was always the sign of the aged, the rocky or the bony, having to do with this strange contour of the country where the sign is said to have developed. So that all things in a long, broad, general term are said to be born in Cancer and to die in Capricorn. That one represents uh, the entrance into life. Cancer is therefore the womb. Capricorn the tomb. Capricorn was symbolized finally by Father Time carrying the, the hourglass and the reaping scythe. And Cancer was symbolized by the great mother, Diana, goddess of the Ephesians, the wonderful nourisher of all things. Cancer was under the rulership of the moon, the lady of generation and Capricorn of Saturn, the ancient uh, master of regeneration. The ancients had already recognized that all birth was a dying, and that all dying was a being born again. Therefore, in ancient times, they buried their dead in the neat chest posture, or the embryo position, indicating that to all things the, the tomb is a womb of another life. These thoughts, undoubtedly, in their philosophy, were mellowed by the ancient astronomical symbolism. The annual birth of the sun god was a tremendously important thing because it contributed very largely to man's concept of immortality. 
The sun was not dead, it only slept. It appeared to die, the earth seemed to die. For the people who devised these concepts were obviously living in the northern hemisphere. The trees seemed to die, snow came, the processes of living were desperate and desolate and cold. But out of it all came also the symbol of the sprig of Arcasia, the evergreen, the little pine tree which later became the Christmas tree because it was associated with the green tree that remained green through the winter and therefore was the symbol of an immortality which was not shared by other trees as far as men could see. In the cult of Saborum, which was the worship of trees, man discovered that the tree did not die though it seemed to be dead. And out of all this seeming of dying, but this fact of living, came some of the deepest and noblest philosophies that revealed themselves to our primitive ancestors. Now having established this little concept of the clock of, year, of the year, we now progress with it further to the great clock. And we come to the Platonic year. Now the sign of the zodiac, for instance, Aries, the ram, which in our uh, annular zodiac is a month, the sun remaining in this sign approximately 30 days. Now this sign becomes a great cycle of years, 2160 years the sun is born in the sign of the ram. After that, it passes out of the ram, and for 2160 years it is born in the sign of the fishes. Then it passes from that, and for 2160 years it is born in the sign of the water bearer, or Aquarius. And thus until it has gone completely by the processional motion around the great platonic cycle. Now men took this measurement and they gave to the length of time which the sun is born annually in one sign. They gave to this the term an age. Now we think of an age now as almost any length of time over 20 years. But the ancient was more particular about it. He referred to these cycles therefore as ages. The age of the fishes. Uh, the age of the ram. Or the... Aryan age, the age of the water bearer or the Aquarian age, and he had names, the Taurian age. Uh, all these different periods became ages, and he began to study. And he also began to observe that there were divisions possible within the 30 degrees of a sign, or in this case, the 2160 years in which the sun by precession, was born within a sign. They divided these signs in half, 15 degrees each. They also divided them into thirds, called decanates, of 10 degrees each. And they divided further into six divisions of five degrees each, and finally into single degrees. And in the Hindu system of astrology, they broke the degrees down to minutes and to seconds. Forming out of all of these combinations a tremendously intricate clock. And they determined to their own satisfaction that great cycles of world events are paralleled uh, in history at the time when the sun by procession goes through certain divisions of a sign ruled by a certain sign itself a degree within the larger pattern of degrees. Out of the general concept of these things have come the practice or habit of ancient nations worshipping their deities under the forms in which the sun was born. Therefore, in the time, let's go back a little bit, and we will say that uh, in the time when the vernal equinox took place in Taurus, the bull, the celestial ox, that this symbol was closely associated with the religion of man, because this was the body in which the avatar took place, 
or the embodiment of the great sun being. The light of the universe was released from this segment of the heavens, and this light was qualified by this great mathematical, astronomical, psychological clock in which all of these occurrences were taking place. So back in the time when this was natural and was happening, we find religions arising that had peculiar affinity to the worship of the bull. We know the Egyptians said that their god Osiris was driven from India to Egypt in the form of the bull Apis. We know that the Egyptians mummified the sacred bulls, that they were peculiar symbols of divine authority, and nearly always in their art the bull is represented with a solar disk between its horns. Virgil says that the bull opens the egg of the year with its horns at the time when the equinox took place in the sign of, of the bull Taurus. We also note that uh, in the Old Testament, the worship of the golden calf, the decoration of the altar of the tabernacle with the horns of rams and of bulls. We also know that in the mysteries of Mithras, the bull was sacrificed, and Mithras, the sun god, is shown slaying the bull. One of these carvings is, was left by the Roman legions in England, and the city of Oxford is named because of the Mithraic ox carving that was found there, going way, way back. We know also that in the Nordic rites, the first gods were licked out of the earth by the cow mother. Hathor, the Egyptian goddess with the head of a cow. We know Nandi, the bull, is the steed upon which the god Shiva rides particularly in his rising. For in India, the Trimuti, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, represents the sun at dawn, the sun at noon, and the sun at sunset. And Pavati, the wife of Shiva, represents the mountains of the west. And Shiva, the sun, you see Pavati, the, the consort, the wife of the Indian god Shiva, was the daughter of Himalayas, the lord of the mountain. And Shiva each day went to court her. And he crossed the sky riding on his handsome bull to visit the house of his beloved, which was the sunset. And when he was united in marriage with Pavati, the goddess of the sunset mountains, the, the child born of them was called Durga, or night. So the union of the sun and sunset resulted in night. It's a perfectly simple astronomical observation, but it became quite interesting, especially when it is well dramatized in Indian artistry. So the sign of the bull also gives us something else. We are told that cherubim, with a blazing sword, were placed at the gates of Eden. The lion of St. Mark. There is one of your four signs. Each of the apostles had one of the four, the four evangelists had these four creatures, the four fixed signs of the zodiac assigned to them. Thus these symbols go on, and we find them not only in ancient times, but in more recent religious history. Now after a length of time, 2160 years to be exact, the procession of the equinoxes retired till it reached the last degree of the sign of Aries, and we find the beginning of a new uh, religion, a new concept of religion. And it is interesting that it should have arisen about 17 or 1800 years before the beginning of the Christian era. For it was at that time, according to the old tradition, that the great mysteries of the Greeks at Eleusis were brought into existence. Perhaps this date is traditional. Perhaps it is astronomical, but the fact is that it served the symbolic purpose. For at that time, it is said that at the time of the vernal equinox, always the time of greatest importance in ancient festival, the hierophant to the rites of Eleusis came forth upon the porch of the temple, carrying in one hand the shepherd's crook, and in his other, in the hollow of his left arm, a newborn lamb. And he held up the shepherd's crook and elevated the lamb to the admiration of the people. And 1800 years before the beginning of the Christian era, 
he cried out in a long, very loud voice, All hail, Lamb of God, that taketh away the sin of the world. Now this lamb is very interesting. This is the Paschal Lamb. This is also the lamb associated with the rites of Jupiter Ammon, the ram-headed god of the ancient Egyptian Latin Greek peoples. Also this was the ram's horns upon uh, the forehead of the a crown of the north and south of the ancient Egyptians. This was the scapegoat of Israel. And here also we have uh, the offering of the lamb as an offering to the Lord and the sacrifice of, of, of Isaac. We have also many references to the blood of the lamb, purification by the lamb, the heart of the lamb, the Angus day, and we find the rites and rituals of the lamb and the symbolism of it, Jason and the golden fleece. For the golden fleece was the symbol of the curtain of the mysteries. And this was the wool that was pulled over the eyes of the unworthy, the symbol of secrecy, the symbol of ritualism. The search for the golden fleece was man's search for truth. Here is the lambskin apron of the ancient Masonic guilds of operative masonry in the Middle Ages. Here are many, many symbols dealing with the mystery of the lamb. And then there came a time when again the equinox continued in its processional motion and the sun at the great moment of the equinox moved from the, last, from the first degree of the sign of the lamb to the last degree of the sign of the fishes. And when it occurred, when this happened, it bent it into the sign which is ruled over by two small fishes. And here we come also to one of the most important points in the entire system of astronomical religion. And that is that the sign of the fishes is the last sign of the zodiac. The sign of the ram is the first. Now someone will say, why? How are you going to divide a circle into first and last? By what strange figuring did men come to the conclusion that Aries was the first sign? The answer goes back to the Vedic researches of India, where it is said that at the beginning of another great age, that lasts much longer than the Platonic year, that at the beginning of a very great cycle of 4,320,000 years, that the original first point of a great cycle of time is established by the conjunction of the five planets and the two luminaries in one sign. This can only occur once in a vast cycle of mathematical calculation. And the last time that the seven met together was in the sign of Aries, by which another great cycle of calculation was established. They will then separate as now and move at various orbits and times through all the different parts of the heavens forming innumerable combinations of themselves. And they will ultimately meet again. And in the next time that they meet, they will meet in the same element, one sign removed. In other words, Aries is the element of fire. But they will not meet in Leo, which is the next fire sign, but in Sagittarius. So the next great cycle will begin with the conjunction of the five planets and the two luminaries in Sagittarius, and that will measure another great cycle of world development. Within this cycle come the great yugas, the four ages which were known as the gold, silver, iron, and bronze ages of the ancients. All these things were mathematical, astronomical phenomena. But for our present moment we say that the sign of Aries is the beginning. And the sign of the fishes is the end of the zodiac. Thus these two come together to form an interesting symbolism. And the sun god, or in this case, uh, say uh, John on Petmos, describing the mysteries that were celebrated there, the Phrygian rites, causes the great being of the Phrygian mysteries to say, I am the Alpha and the Omega 
the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now this also has very great uh, interest because of two uh, symbols particularly associated with Christianity. One is the fish. The first symbol of the Christians was a fish. And in Rome they recognized each other by drawing the shape of the fish upon the sand. It, the name for fish was an acrostic on the name for Christ. St. Augustine says that Christ was a fish broiled for the sins of man. It's a very interesting symbolism. So we find Christ standing, calling the apostle, and saying, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. The miracle of the fishes, the drought of the fishes, the miracle of the coin in the fish's mouth, many other miracles that relate to the story. And Jesus in speaking, going forth upon a ship on the Sea of Galilee, the water symbol of the fish is very interesting. One of the ancient deities came forth out of the sea as Dagon, or the fish man. And the bishop's mitre of the Christian church is a fish's head on end. These things are important. For here we find a transition taking place. And at this transition of sign, the rising of a faith, a faith which had as its principal symbols, the two principles, or two ideas, the uh, Lamb of God and the Fisher of Men. The fisherman's ring is the ring of the Pope. The symbol of the papacy was the great fisherman, named from Peter, who was referred to not, recent, not very long ago in a book called The Big Fisherman. He was, he was the Fisher of Men, and this was the symbolism. Now if you look in your zodiac, you will find that directly across from the sign of the fishes is its opposite. Each sign has its opposite. There being twelve signs. And the opposite sign to the fishes is the sign of Virgo, the Virgin. And the Assumption of the Virgin, the Feast of the Assumption of the Virgin, takes place when the sun, the symbol of the principle of life, is in the sign of the Virgin. It's a very interesting uh, parallel again. Now the Virgin in ancient times was Ceres or Cori, the mother who was always still a Virgin, because she brought forth immaculately the food, the earth, the grain, the flowers, the trees. Everything were bo was born from her, but she was still the mother of mysteries, the eternal Virgin. She was Isis, the mysterious being whose veil no man could lift. And this uh, symbol in ancient astronomy carried in its arms either a sheath of grain, as Cori did, or sometimes uh, the loaves of, of the Passover, or the unleavened bread. So we have an interesting thing. Jesus the sun entering the symbol of the equinox and the sign of the fish performed the miracle of feeding the multitude with two fishes and the barley loaves and there were twelve baskets of scraps left again the circle of the zodiac later when the time came for the master to prepare for the Passover he sent a disciple into the city and he said to him, You will see a man who carries a pitcher of water on his shoulder. Follow that man. When he enters into a house, go in likewise, and go to the upper room and say that your master wishes it to celebrate the Passover. Who is the man with the pitcher of water on his shoulder? He is the Egyptian deity Canopus, the water man. He is also Aquarius, the water bearer always represented in the ancient system of the zodiac as a man carrying a pitcher of water on his shoulder. He carried that pitcher of water long before the beginning of the Christian era. So the sun, moving on, goes into the new age, or the age that is to come, to celebrate again its passing over in the sign of the water bearer. 
Of course, the sign or the ritual of the Passover is the passing over of the sun at the time of the equinox. All these rituals have been very carefully measured to meet the astronomical requirements. Like the epoch and the golden year and all these things, we have calculations to run through every one of these symbols. Now one of the great questions that has arisen perhaps in our studies a little has been to determine if possible the time of the beginning of the age of the fishes or what we call the Piscean age. It is of course a, a nice right trite contrivance to say that it began with the beginning of the Christian era. But in India and in many other countries a point is made with which some Western astronomers and astrologers will certainly be at variance. Namely, that at the present time the equinox is taking place approximately in the eighth degree of the sign of the fishes. It hasn't left, it hasn't moved into this other age yet. If the Indian and the old Chaldeo Babylonian calculation is correct by a very curious thing, a circumstance that is almost too remarkable to be a coincidence. The vernal equinox should have entered the sign of the fishes approximately the year 325 A.D. And that was the year of the establishment of the Christian church by the Council of Nicaea. It would have entered at the time when the heaviest influence was in the, uh, upon the quality of Leo, which also corresponded exactly. If from that point on you calculate each step of the precession of the equinoxes from that time to the present day you will find some very remarkable things if you break up the year as the ancient did. Now if you take this period the age of the fishes and what is this age? Now you go back to your tables of Sargon the king of Babylon where the first delineations of the signs and planets are given. <coughs> There's been no change in the readings of these symbols for nearly 4,000 years. And we find that the sign of the fishes was represented in that time and still is in astrology as a sign of water, the sign of retribution, the sign of the deluge, the sign of obscuration, the sign of karmic fulfillment the sign of the end of an old way, the termination of patterns. In the great sun, uh, sun cycle in China, the deluge of, uh, which ends the world is always associated with the sign of the fishes. And the reorganization or building of the new world naturally follows. But in this constellational diffusion, if we observe it carefully, there is a strangely psychological relationship between the key words of the sign of the fishes and the strange state of our world ever since this strange equinoctial occurrence took place. The obscuration, the hiddenness, and at the same time, the strange spirituality which is associated with this sign, the mysticism, the inner and deeper yearning and longing, the age of the ministry, the age of the struggle, the strife, the pain, the problem, the winding up, the paying off of all debts, the completion of work left unfinished. And in many ways that is a bit typical of the situations we find ourselves in. Now as we say we have about 2160 years to work with from the beginning of this cycle. And if we do assume for a moment that it could coincide with the Council of Nicaea, which was the formal creation of the church. And we know that uh, from the uh, time of this council on, the integration of the church took place. It became a religion. Prior to that, it was a group of scattered communities without leadership or organization. If we add one half of the period of that cycle, 
If we divide this great period of 2160 years right in half to divide the age into a positive and negative half, where does the half line drop? It drops approximately in the year 1400. In fact, it drops a little closer than that. It drops almost identically on the exact date set aside as the date of the Renaissance, the great change in our world, the beginning of the modern world as we know it, the moving from the negative half of the sign to the positive half. We break down the sign step by step and we find everywhere that these major cycles hit exactly with the prominent dates in the cultural and, the, and moral and spiritual growth of our peoples. And it seems very possible that this was the basis, this study of the great platonic year was the basis of the fortunate uh, long-range predictions of men like Nostradamus, who could not have worked it by the ordinary methods that we know, but only by the great precessional motion. Now from all this we come to many other symbols. And I think there is one that, I, that is fascinating enough uh, to give a little thought to. Uh, during this period that uh, we call the medieval world, there lived a very interesting and kindly old gentleman who is known as the Venerable Bede. He is called Venerable because he was on his way to canonization, but he never got any further than the first step by which he became Venerable, as one of these terms that precedes full canonization. Now the Venerable Bede was uh, a very pious soul, and he had a great sorrow in his, in his heart, something that he just could hardly bear. And that was to contemplate the motion of a pagan heaven over a Christian earth. Here were all the constellations, here was the Argonaut sailing off, here was Cetus the great whale, here were all these symbols, Hercules and Pegasus and Ariadne and all this, all moving over a perfectly respectable Christian commonwealth. It just didn't seem right. So the Venerable Bee decided to Christianize the heavens. And he did it. And we have in the library two very beautiful astronomical charts, very large ones, original prints from the Middle Ages, in full color, showing the Christian universe. He did it very simply. He simply took the various constellations and transformed them. The crator, or cup of the Greeks, became the Holy Grail. The twelve signs of the zodiac became the twelve disciples. Nothing could be simpler. Uh, Cetus, the great fish, Leviathan, became Jonah's whale. And the Argonaut kept on sailing as Noah's Ark. All these symbols were perfectly fitted together. And the result was a great success. But suddenly everybody stopped in their tracks. Somebody had let the cat out of the bag. Actually, the symbolism proved the common origin of both groups. Actually, these symbols that were put in the place of the old were the equivalents in a new faith of identically the same principles. So everybody hushed it up and forgot about it until the French Revolution came along with still a different idea and the situation has lapsed back waiting now for another revolution on the part of scientists who probably will want to change all of these because they can't stand the superstitions of any group so that uh, now you don't speak about planets and, uh, well, not plan uh, speak about signs you speak about so many degrees of right ascension it's so much less personal and so much more scientific but it comes out to the same place <laughs> also astrology is now giving uh, way to a kind of new science which is going to be called cosmography or something of that nature in which they are going to do something that was never heard of before they're going to consider the possibility that the heavens influence the earth <laughs> so they're going to do it with a new name and the right man is going to discover it which is very very important in our times but this concept of the universe again shows much that tells us of the old ways and of the old concepts and rites. In the old days, the initiation rituals of the temples 
always followed in some mysterious manner this astronomical pattern. Apuleius, for example, in the Metamorphosis, describes his own initiation into the mysteries as far as he can. Then he says that to preserve his vows he must be silent. But he does explain that at one degree or part of the rite, this candidate is enveloped in a blue cloak covered with stars and constellations to indicate that he is being lifted up into the higher parts of the universe. Epulius also tells us that in one of the degrees of the mysteries he beheld the sun shining under his feet at midnight, which is a very interesting point, looking very much as though somebody knew something about uh, the astronomical theory, because theoretically at midnight that's approximately where you might expect it to be. Also he describes the rituals. And uh, he follows very closely the description given by Porphyry in his Cave of the Nymphs, which is an interpretation of one section of the Odyssey of Homer. And he describes the cave of initiation, in which you descend under the earth and come into a room, the ceiling of which is made to represent the sky. And there are two entrances, one on each side, and you descend a set of steps. You walk across a common ground and ascend out to another set of steps. And the, the point of uh, entrance into this underworld is called Cancer. And the point of exit is called Capricorn. And the adventures, wanderings, and terrible experiences of the candidate seeking initiation represents the motion of the sun through the signs Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, and Sagittarius. Now if you can imagine placing Cancer at one gate and Capricorn at the other and going down now uh, to the point between them, you will find you have sort of tipped your celestial globe so that now the bottom point is represented by the sign of Libra which is now between the two. <clears throat> Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra. Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, you're out. So that Libra is placed at the center in the bottom. The sign of Libra is the scales. Here the soul descending into the underworld comes into the judgment hall of Osiris where his consciousness or his conscience is weighed upon the scales in the psychostatia. The ancient peoples only had a zodiac of ten signs at one time in a very remote period. They had no sign of Libra, and Virgo Scorpio were one sign, and that is still indicated by the general shape of the two, except that in one the end of the M-like figure turns up, and in the other it turns back. Now at the time of the so-called fall of man, it was believed that the signs were divided and Libra was inserted between them. There is a very ancient doctrine about that. Increasing the number of the signs to twelve. But the sign of the scales placed in the judgment hall of the twin truths in the temple of Amentet is at the bottom of this V-like pattern of the descent of man into judgment or into generation. This judgment or testing in the mysteries follows very closely the entire cycle of ancient times and the ancient initiation ritual. Now there is also a very interesting story relating to the human embryo. For if the embryo is twisted inward to form its equivalent to a circle, the embryo, which has at the beginning, as you realize, a caudal appendage resembling a tail, looking very much like a highly developed polywog, this structure, if twisted into a circular form, equals three quarters of a circle. In other words, it takes nine twelfths of a circle to do this. But there is there are three signs or three parts of the circle that are not touched. The head and tail of the figure do not meet. 
Therefore, this occurs to us in our Old Testament symbolism under the story of the broken wheel. And this broken wheel, or the nine-twelfths wheel, is again an astronomical symbol that has played a considerable part in human thinking. Because the nine-twelfths represent the nine months of generation, or the period in which the child is being formed. The three missing signs, or the broken spokes of the wheel, or the missing rim of the wheel at that point, fulfills the rites of the Eleusinian Mysteries. For the Eleusinian Mysteries were given in two sections, the nine lesser and the three greater rites. The nine lesser rites being the symbolical rites of generation, the three greater rites of regeneration. Therefore, by nine months and three degrees, a man is made perfect. This is a very curious symbolism, but it has a great deal of interest if we know how to study it. In other words, the individual, to pass through the second birth, must go through the womb of the mysteries to complete the circle, of which nine parts only are provided in generation. The Chinese, fully aware of that, declare a child to be one year old after it has reached the third month. It celebrates its first birthday three months after it is born. This is part of a, of a very curious doctrine, but it points to the three winter or fall months leading toward final death. It is to do with the blinding of Samson, the cutting off of the rays of the sun god, also has to do, as Leonardo da Vinci points out in his astronomical calculation of the Last Supper, for the painting is a very strangely astute piece of work. And each of the apostles, and each of the positions and groupings, you will find the apostles are grouped in triplicities, exactly like the signs. And the sign of Scorpio is assigned to Judas. Now why should the sign of Scorpio be assigned to Judas? In the Orient, there is something about the scorpion that is very peculiar. First of all, it stings with its tail. Therefore, it is the backbiter. The second thing that is about it that is strange is that the mark which it leaves is always in the form of a minute pair of human lips. The kiss of death. The kiss of betrayal. So that was the sign that was used to signify the destroyer, Typhon who is also responsible for the destruction of the good god Osiris. The sign of the scorpion, however, in the ancient rituals has three meanings. Three creatures have been assigned to it down through the ages. And depending upon the one that is selected, uh, you have some concept of the true meaning of it. The scorpion is the one, is one sign that is associated with it. The second sign that is associated with it is the serpent. The third sign that is associated with it is the phoenix. So the scorpion, the serpent, and the phoenix were all given to that one sign of the zodiac. And the Rosicrucian mysteries of old European mysticism always bestowed their higher rites at the time of the sun being in a certain degree of Scorpio. Therefore, Scorpio was the symbol of death and rebirth, of evil and redemption. Most of all, it was man transcending his own inferior nature. It was the symbol of initiation into the secret rites which symbolize death. It was the death of the old and birth into the new. It is death always leading to liberation. And we find all through the ancient symbolism these parallels carefully preserved even into your alchemical mysteries. And in the combinations and structures of the alchemical stone of the wise man, there is what is called the horoscope of the stone. In other words, there is a symbol of the universe represented as a particular pattern of planets 
And in this pattern of planets, the formula for the stone of the philosopher and the elixir of life and the transmutation of metal is said to have been concealed. And the mysterious eight-sided vault of Christian Rosenkreutz was formed into the symbol of a solar system, in the midst of which the body of the ancient adept is said to have been placed. All of these peculiar symbols trail down through the ages, reminding us of the numerous forms of indebtedness that we have to the planetary symbols. The Dionysian artificers, the great builders of the Greek cathedrals and churches, and also the builders of the theaters of Dionysus. Later they became the great Lombard builders of Europe, the builders of the medieval world and the Renaissance, the great Comocene masters. Nearly every one of the structures that they built was based mathematically upon a constellation. Uh, Cesarino, in his edition of Vitruvius, the great master of architecture, shows how the modes of architecture were based upon the great constellational patterns and that the temples of the gods were built according to the stars of the constellations in which these gods were said to be enthroned. A very elaborate and involved system of architecture rose therefore from this same consideration. Also we remember Gaffaro, the astronomer astrologer to Cardinal Richelieu, pointing out how the handwriting on the wall of heaven described in the Old Testament is actually a study of star groups in which the star constellations form the consonants of the Hebrew alphabet and the planets moving through them form the vowels and the constant motion of the vowels and the consonants produced the writing upon the wall of sky which the ancient prophets could read. There are many references to these things and gradually there emerges to our consideration a concept of sidereal motion of human growth and of the linking of these two together in a highly complicated scientific concept. The details of this were evolved over so long a period of time and with such astuteness that it is almost impossible for us to exhaust the research work that has come down to us. Unfortunately, of course, it has been largely mutilated, but enough remains to give us a tremendous amount of guidance if we actually want to have this guidance. We have other things that um, come out of this constellational study. The constellation, the oldest circular zodiac known, that which was found at Dendera in Egypt and is now in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, is a magnificent sandstone slab containing a study of the world, of the heavens, as they were known at that time. Many symbols and figures are included in this zodiac which we no longer recognize or have any means of fully understanding. But we do have certain points that are very interesting. The Egyptians referred to what we call the great bear as the plow. It was the symbol of the turner of the furrows. And of course the ox of heaven was the one that drew the plow. This plow moved around uh, the great polar star. And we have their knowledge now, which corresponds rather well with that of China and India, relating uh, to the axis of this great system. According to the Egyptians and uh, several other ancient peoples, the earth had more than two motions. Flammarion says 11, and I think the ancients were very near to that. They recognized particularly a peculiar oscillation of the pole by means of which it seemed to point hypothetically at different times to various stars or near to various stars forming the little bear. Therefore the ancients termed this constellation in India the Rishi or the great sages who at various times incarnated to become rulers of the earth. And of these great sages one that we know perhaps the best is Vyasa, the great sage of the Mahabharata. This uh, comes to us also in Egypt. 
the Egyptians, following many ancient peoples and following practices still held under certain circumstances today, were concerned with the mystery of the northern point of the heavens. They were never able to observe that the sun moved northward in the sense of ever occupying the northern segment of the sky. It came nearer or further, but never did it do in the north what it did in the south, as far as their visual awareness was concerned. Therefore, the northern hemisphere, in the Egyptian ritual also, uh, was represented as the direction of darkness. In the ancient temple, there was a gate at the east, west, and south, but no gate at the north. Now, as a result of that, it has been held that people believed that from what the Greeks call the Hyperborean, or the area or region north of the winds, Hyperboreus, that from this region came only frost and snow giants and monsters. The Egyptians, however, did not do it that way. They had a very interesting astronomical outlook. Out. Measurements have been taken uh, to study the glyph used in Egypt as the symbol of the great gods, particularly the abode of the great gods. This is always what appears to be an inverted bowl or a half circle. Uh, turned upon a straight line. In other words, the bowl bowls or bulges upward, forming a half circle. This is a boss, mountain, or raised place. And through that streaks a line, like a vertical, not quite vertical staff, it is off the vertical. And at the upper end of that staff is a little flag symbol, just like a little banner, a quadrangle, uh, apparently of cloth or something. The sign of a deity was always the staff with the flag, probably because in those days great and honored persons were accompanied by bearers of devices, heraldic symbols, much like the knight errants of the Middle Ages. But the thing that has always amazed students of Egyptology is the reason why in the abode of the great gods this flag staff cuts at an angle into this mountain or in this mound. So somebody, for no good reason, perhaps it was Lepsius, or one of the other early Egyptologists, began to study the inclination of this flag. And he examined a number of instances of it in great monuments. Of course, you can't be certain in hastily written documents by comparatively poor scribes, but in the great stone carvings, in the great sarcophagi texts, and so on, he studied these things, and he found this was always the same. And he measured a little further, and he found that it coincides exactly with our inclination of the Earth's axis. What is it then? This mountain and this flag represents the North Pole, which was the abode of the gods, the great gods, that dwelled in silence. And in Egypt there was no symbol, no emblem, and no figure for the great gods. All the known gods, the gods of provinces, the creator gods, the cosmocrators, and the various Ammonian artificers, the creating gods that became later the Elohim of the opening chapters of Genesis. These deities are variously represented, sometimes with knives, representing the gougers, or the ones that carved matter out of space and formed worlds. Sometimes as Ka, the potter of Memphis, forming the globe on a potter's wheel. Always the concept of the potter's wheel and its turning, however. They seem to be aware of that motion in their ancient rituals. A little later, further research indicated that on the great figures of Osiris, the plume double crown of the North-South Empire was always worn at the same inclination. So the crown of Egypt corresponded in the inclination in relationship to the vertical, corresponded with that of the flag inclination on the mound and also with the polar inclination. So here was an adornment, a symbol, tying to another principle, the principle of the pole and the polar mountain. Also we know the great pyramid by its orientation was an astronomical marker of some nature or kind. The complex of pyramids 
have been regarded as improbable, uh, probably the elements of a vast sundial system, similar in some ways to the complex of stones in England at Stonehenge, which was used by the Druids to determine the exact moment of the winter solstice. Here the great rituals were performed, particularly by capturing the ray of the newborn sun in a crystal lens in order to stop the sacred fires by what we call burning glasses. All these symbols uh, are intriguing, and the great gods of the north, and the silence of these gods dwelling forever above the earth, correspond, of course, uh, to the Indian concept of Mount Miru, which is to the north. And in the Buddhist doctrine, Chang Shambhala, the city of the gods, means Chang North. It means that it is the city of the north. And it is said that it is so glorious and so magnificent that lights are forever radiating from it. The Aurora Borealis. This house of the gods in the great north corresponds to the entire great concept of primitive Aryan myth and ritual. The ritual brought down from India along the migrations of the Aryans down the, uh, the Indo-Gangetic plain long, long ago. Nor can we say that uh, other peoples were not aware of these things. In your Central American complex of cultures, your pyramid builders and so on, you have great consideration given to the North and to the mystery that is hidden there. And the recognition that it has to do with the secret source of the universe, the great darkness from which light came, because in all these systems the great sun globe is always the child of heaven, the symbol of the, the, the first and only begotten of the veiled mother who is space, whose mystery no man can solve. The sun gods then go into their infinite diversity of activities. But always the sun god is a child of fatality. And we have another interesting group of legends arising which are called the, the myth of the dangerous child. This is the child whose coming is predestined and looked forward to by the wise, whose birth darkness attempts to prevent by despotism, who finally rises triumphant over his enemies, becomes the ruler of his kingdom, is betrayed and dies, and is buried at the winter solstice. Buried, as the ancient legend tells us, over the brow of a hill. And here he remains, until by three degrees, or three days, or three signs, he is raised again at Easter. And this great cycle goes on and on and on. The cycle of the religious mystery of the sun divinity. Many times we find the solar face also. In among the Peruvians and among the peoples uh, of the great South American complex uh, that finally came under the control of the Inca chieftains, Viracana, the god of the air, is, was worshipped by kissing the sunbeam. All you did was face it and kiss the light, and that was your adoration for God. The symbol, the supreme symbol in that area, was the great golden disk of the sun. And the story is told that it was a disk of solid gold and jewels, 11 feet in diameter. And when the conquistadors under Pizarro divided up the spoils, one of them got this sun disk as his spoil by a throw of dice, and a few moments later lost it to another soldier by another throw of dice. That was the way things were done in those days. But these people undoubtedly recognized the same basic concept. Their rites and ceremonies and what we learn of their religion shows that they also based all of their calculations upon the sovereignty of the solar power and its great journey. This is the dangerous journey of the sun, the hazardous journey which is beset uh, by all manner of problem, like the journey of Siegfried down the river, the great Rhine journey, that leads him finally to the house of the Gibichung, 
where he is betrayed and killed by Hagen, the symbol of winter, the dark one. These different emblems, and we find them everywhere, call, also show in the Maya complex. At the, on the Casa de los Monas at Chichen Itza in Yucatan, the so-called House of the Nuns, uh, there is over the doorway of the ecclesia or small chapel, the great one, Itzamna, the Lord of the Mysteries, he of the azure plumes of the bird of paradise, and he is seated in the solar egg, surrounded by rays of light going in all directions. He is the great one whose tabernacle is in the sun. Beneath him spread out the ancient Myra glyphs for water. Around him clouds and lightning, but he is the great solar one. Now later, from him, by an immaculate conception, by the virgin Shoshi Quetzal, was born Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, the symbol of the sun's path and also of the same mysterious modes of the lunar arc which cause what we call today uh, the dragon's head and tail in astrological research, the motion of the lunar orbit. And this great deity, Quetzalcoatl, was the good god, the sun god. He wore the bonnet of the Quetzal plumes, which was the symbol of the solar light rays, the feathers going out in all directions. For the Quetzal is the bird that is born of the sun, and when the time comes for it to die, it flies back to the sun. And the Quetzal, like the thunderbird of the American Indian, is just another phoenix. And this again is the symbol of priesthoods, the symbol of the wise ones, or the sun gods, the sun-born ones, who are the keepers of the ancient mysteries. And this Quetzalcoatl served his people well, brought them out of darkness and ignorance. But finally there came from the south the evil one, the red-mirrored god Tezcatlipoco, the god of Mars. And this evil deity destroyed the power of the sun god. And the sun god departed finally upon a raft of serpents from the shores at Veracruz, promising to return. But this whole cycle was a sun-venus cycle, and the astronomy of these people proves it. The pyramid of the sun at Chichen Itza is an absolutely correct astronomical representation of the year. There are just as many steps on that pyramid as there are days in the year, and so on. All of these buildings are astronomically built and oriented. And at the apex of the year, in the high point, was the temple to the deity. The deity itself represented by the feathered serpent or the dragon. And the feathered serpent again, the symbol of the year, as in the Mexican calendar, where all the divisions on the calendar stone, the months of the year, are placed as scales upon the body of a serpent. Thus every part of this mythology, and it is this same serpent, which is Python, which is slain by the sun god every year, when he overcomes the year, and becomes master of life, or the keeper of the year. And every year also at the end, the year destroys him, and uh, the new sun god must be born. So out of all of these concepts, perhaps you will have some general idea of the part that astronomy has played in religious symbolism. Now we do not say that astronomy has given the meaning, but we do say that it has constituted the convenient symbolism and has rationalized and made uh, authentic the outer structure of the mystical philosophy that is based upon the inner meaning of these symbols. And as we go through the series, we will try to explore that also, to find the ideas that are behind the use of these symbolic forms. But I'm afraid for that you're going to have to wait for next week.